Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Amy Gautrod, and I work in the Nutrition Resource Center at Gordon Food Service. We know your schedules are extremely hectic, and we feel confident that this webinar will be time well spent. Safe kitchens have always been an important focus, but that focus has intensified and evolved based on creating a safe kitchen in the time of this public health crisis. As operators at skilled nursing communities or perhaps a director operating a K-12 emergency feeding site, this focus has never been so important. Today's webinar is going to focus on cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. We will also briefly cover laundry. We know this may not be pertinent to all of you in your current role, but because this webinar is being recorded, we thought a brief overview may be helpful to someone within your organization as well. We are so fortunate to have two expert guests with us today. First, Eric Losey. Eric Losey is an expert guest of U.S. Chemical. He has over 20 years of experience in the industry and 12 years of experience with U.S. Chemical. Additionally, we have Tammy Bouchard. She has been with Gordon Food Service for over 20 years. And in her current role as the North American Category Manager of Cleaning Solutions, Tammy works very closely with vendors that support cleaning solutions to ensure Gordon Food Service has the right product, mix, right product mix to support all of you. So I think we can all agree that Tammy and Eric's worlds have been incredibly hectic. So we greatly appreciate both of them taking the time to share their insight, knowledge, and passion when it comes to safe kitchens. Eric is going to be our main presenter, and Tammy will be chiming in as applicable based on some questions that might be coming through. And we'll also handle questions upon completion of today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. As with any other webinar, you can hear us, however we cannot hear you. So please do take advantage of that question box located within your GoTo panel. And remember, you can ask those questions at any time. We have applied for continuing education uh, units which are currently pending approval with the following organizations, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the School Nutrition Association, and the Association of Food and Nutrition Professionals. That certificate will be emailed out to all attendees tomorrow, Wednesday morning. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Eric and Tammy. Thank you very much, Amy. Again, this is Eric Losey with U.S. Chemical. I certainly appreciate uh, all of you uh, signing on this afternoon. And again, we have developed this training, Safe Kitchens in Times of COVID-19. And as Amy stated, it's really going to be focused around sanitizing and disinfecting and the best practices. So as we've put this together, it's really meant to remind ourselves of the right processes, procedures, and safety measures we need to move forward uh, and operate in a safe manner during and post COVID-19. And we know a lot of things have changed and even more will be changing in the very near future. So we believe at this point, this will help us put our foot in the right direction. So some of the topics that we're going to be talking about are the products that we have in the array line that are certified per the EPA to kill COVID-19, uh, EPA product efficacy reports. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about sanitizers and disinfecting, then specific sanitizing and disinfecting procedures for dish machines, three compartment sinks, and surface sanitizing, and really based upon what we see changing and not changing in the near future. And then finally, we'll talk about non-food service, uh, disinfecting and environmental service, laundry, and then finally staying safe. So with that, we can take a look at the nine different products that the EPA is allowing us to claim kills the human coronavirus or COVID-19. So previously to this pandemic, if you did not have a product or a disinfectant that had a kill claim per the EPA, for either killing SARS or the human coronavirus, you could not claim that you were going to be able to kill COVID-19. So at this point, and we'll get into EPA efficacy reports here in a little bit. Um, however, if you ever see an EPA efficacy report from any manufacturer distributor that 
actually says COVID-19, uh, something's kind of wrong there because the EPA has not gotten around yet to updating any efficacy reports. I mean, it is a global pandemic, so they're a little busy right now. Um, so no, you may see that on some marketing material, but not on an actual EPA efficacy report. So these are the nine EPA registered disinfectants through Gordon Food Service in their array line that already kind of pre-qualify for killing COVID-19. So I know this, this chart or this list looks a little confusing, but there's a reason I wanted to put it together. And that is because and though most of the folks that are on this call are, are, for the most part, they're all food service. These are all disinfectants and they're all quaternary ammonium disinfectants. And unfortunately, sanitizers do not kill COVID-19 or the human coronavirus. Only a disinfectant will. So we feel very strongly moving forward the industry sees that not only will you have to have a registered sanitizer for your dish machine and your three compartment sink, but you'll also need a registered disinfectant to clean some of the uh, environmental service areas. If you're in a restaurant, it'll be some of the restrooms and even lobby areas. Now, we've all sat side by side with a health inspector as they tested the three compartment sink sanitizing concentration, and we know what that's like. Well, moving forward again, we also feel that disinfectants are going to be one of those things that now we're going to have to be regulated to have. And not only that, but it will have to be at its label dilution and its concentration. So anytime that you are uh, purchasing and using uh, an array disinfectant, know that this information is written in both English and in Spanish. So the dilution ratio of that disinfectant as well as the concentration, whether it be 600, 700, 900 parts per million, will have to match what's actually on the label. And the reason I want to call that out is because we're trying to squash an industry myth that if you have a disinfectant, specifically quaternary ammonium, which is what all these nine products are, if it's over 400 parts per million, it's automatically a disinfectant. Well, while that's true, that's not necessarily the point. What actually is going to matter is the specific concentration points of these disinfectants as the health specter will begin to test them. Last point that I want to make about this slide is that we already know, we already discussed that sanitizing alone will not necessarily kill COVID-19. Just kind of a side point that, I mean, hand washing for 20 seconds does eradicate COVID-19. We do believe that sanitizing goes a very long way in eradicating this virus. However, the EPA is not allowing us to state that a sanitizer would kill it. So these last three products, products 7, 8, 9, Ultimate Sanitizer, Ultimate Sanitizer Q, and Quat Clean are actually a dual-use quaternary product, which means that one dilution ratio can be a sanitizer, and at a different dilution ratio, it can be a disinfectant. At any point throughout this training, if I'm referring to any of these three products in terms of killing COVID-19 or the human coronavirus, it will only be in its disinfecting state. Again, sanitizing alone will not kill the human coronavirus, which is unfortunate because we're really unable to disinfect inside of a food service facility or on food contact surfaces. But we'll get into a little bit more of that later. Okay, so just recently, um, Tammy and some of the other folks uh, at Gordon Food Service were gracious enough to kind of create a new item code here for us in these changing times of you know COVID-19 and, and beyond where you currently you have a QT40 test strip and that's through you know either pH or hydration uh, that will test your sanitizing solution that would be either 200 parts per million or it might even be a range between 150 and 400 so we would always use a QT40 test strips for testing sanitizers now again moving forward we believe that as we begin to open up all these facilities health inspectors are going to start looking at the concentrations of quat disinfectants in which you're going to need a QT1000 test strip that doesn't just go from 0 to 500, it goes from 0 all the way up to 1000. Here's the unfortunateness about these test strips, and it's not these specific test strips, it's all test strips together, and that is you cannot use the QT1000 test strips to test both disinfectants and sanitizers. Unfortunately, the QT1000s just simply aren't accurate enough to test the small concentration ranges 
of a sanitizer, again, between about 150 and 400. So really, at this point, we can begin purchasing these QT1000s in anticipation of needing more disinfectants for our restrooms and lobby areas and areas like that. But we must use those specifically for disinfectant testing and use the QT40 test strips only for the sanitizing back in food service. So we're lucky to have those uh, on board now. And what I'd like to talk about now is EPA efficacy reports. Now, it's also lovingly known as a kill claim, but an EPA efficacy report has us on the manufacturer side. When we create a disinfectant or sanitizer solution, we actually submit that to the EPA and they test it. And what comes back is called an efficacy report, and they tell us what it kills, and we are able to put that on what's called an efficacy report. Now, what's important is the EPA mandates a full 10 minutes of wet contact time. And again, this is for disinfecting non-food contact surfaces, and we'll get into sanitizing here in a little bit. But we're going to need that full 10-minute contact time per the EPA for a broad spectrum efficacy. We are not just solely worried about COVID-19. Of course, that's always on top of mind. That's been in the news for the past nine, 10 weeks, and everybody is concerned about it. However, we need to worry about all the microorganisms. That would be the viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So right now, it's very, very popular to go out and try to find the absolute best product, the one that kills COVID-19 the fastest possible. And I'll use our product, TB Quat, for an example. It has a kill time of uh, for coronavirus of two minutes. So you clean that surface, then you apply the disinfectant, and the coronavirus is dead in two minutes, and then you wipe it back up. Well, unfortunately, we didn't give it the broad spectrum efficacy, and the coronavirus did die, but other microorganisms, for example, hepatitis A, they won't die for another 10 minutes. So that's great, we've killed COVID-19, but now we have an hepatitis A outbreak. So the industry as a whole, manufacturing facilities, distributors, marketers, we're really trying to hopefully set this record straight that we're looking for a broad spectrum kill, not just cherry picking one virus, one bacteria, one fungi. So it's incredibly important. Yes, do we care about COVID-19? Of course we do. But we also care about MRSA, noro, streptococcus, HIV, all of them. So we need to, regardless of the kill time on one virus or another, we need to give it the full 10-minute efficacy for, for broad-spectrum effect. So it's very, very important. EPA efficacy reports, and any time that you as the individual end user needs those, you can contact Gordon Food Service or a member of the manufacturer, and we can get you those efficacy reports no problem. Okay, now we'll talk about a little bit the differences between sanitizing and disinfecting. So when sanitizing, obviously, we're only going to sanitize on food contact surfaces. And when we do that, we're looking at killing roughly 99.9% .9 of all listed microorganisms either on the label or on the efficacy report. And we're really talking about uh, more foodborne illnesses like salmonella, E. coli, streptococcus, things like that. So the EPA defines a food contact surface a little bit different given the area that it's in. So in the kitchen, or what we like to call the back of the house, the EPA defines a food contact surface as any surface the product or the food will touch while in the process of making that dish. So that would include a cutting board, the cutlery, prep tables, even a can opener is considered a food contact surface as the blade of that opener comes into contact with food as you're opening that can. So that's how the EPA defines a food contact surface in the kitchen. In the dining room, it's a little bit different. Instead of focusing on the food, they're actually focused on the guest the, or the patient or the resident. So they define it as a surface in which the guest would touch while in the process of eating that food. So and again, the kitchen, they focus on the food. In the dining room, the EPA really focuses on the surfaces that you would touch. So it goes well beyond the the cups, the bowls, the plates, the silverware, all the things that are cleaned and sanitized in either the dish machine or the three compartment sink. Now, it feels like it's been forever since any of us have really gone out to eat at a restaurant. But if you can recall back all of the different surfaces that you remember touching while in the process of eating that meal. So you're looking at the table, the chairs, especially the high chairs for some of those kiddos, right? The menus, 
the salt and pepper shaker. These, these things are literally the last thing we touch just before we begin to eat our food. So even a salt and pepper shaker is considered a food contact surface by EPA definition. Okay, disinfecting is a little bit different. Now we're talking specifically on non-food contact surfaces, restrooms, lobby areas, down the halls, inside resident rooms. But instead of killing 99.9% of all listed microorganisms. Now we're after some of the tougher ones. We're actually killing 99.999% of some of the microorganisms like MRSA, Noro, uh, C. diff, and unfortunately, human coronavirus or COVID-19. So when we're disinfecting, we're really focused on the common touch points. For example, in a restroom, it's gonna be doorknobs, light switches, faucets, sinks arounds, toilets, urinals, even some of the um, non-hands-free soap dispensers that you might find where you have to press the button to get it out. That's literally the last surface you touch before you get clean hands. So even something like that is a common touch point and needs to be disinfected regularly. All right, so to break it down again, food contact surfaces, we're gonna sanitize and again, a 60 second contact time per the CDC and the food code, but we're gonna sanitize those before or after every single use. A non-food contact surface, really up until now uh, and moving forward post-COVID-19, we're really looking at instead of a facility kind of cleaning their restrooms every, you know, every day, maybe twice a day, whatever, that it's going to be more mandated that they're disinfecting uh, every two to four hours. And that's kind of the what we're reading coming down the pipeline. We're not quite sure if it's going to be two, three, or four, but we're looking at uh, more regulated um, uh, times. So one thing that I wanted to point out, and that is with the disinfectants, the nine disinfectants that we have in the array line uh, that are registered through the EPA to kill COVID-19 are all quaternary ammonium-based products. Now, there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways to sanitize or disinfect. We can use uh, accelerated hydrogen peroxide. We can use chlorine, even though it's very corrosive. We can use chlorine, uh, iodine, acid. Even we, ha we have four bowl cleaners in the array line that are EPA registered disinfectants because of their low pH. But only quaternary ammonium based products have what's called a bacterial static effect, which means it continues to stop the reproductive rate of microorganisms for a further 24 hours. Now, me being a professional germaphobe, it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll take salmonella, for example. The reproductive rate uh, for salmonella, it'll double in population every 15 minutes. Using a quaternary ammonium-based product with a bacterial static effect halts and stops that reproductive rate of that bacteria for another 24 hours. Chlorine does not have that. Accelerated hydrogen peroxide doesn't have it. Acid iodine. Nothing has that bacterial static effect like quaternary ammonium, and that's what's very, very important. One of the things that we as an industry are, are really kind of starting to try to tamp down a little bit is having so many people kind of looking for that magic button, that one product that they didn't know about that's going to solve all of their problems. I mean, it's a, it's a cleaner, it's a sanitizer, it disinfects, it's a floor cleaner, and oh, by the way, it's also a great glass cleaner. Listen, if it was not prevalent three months ago, it shouldn't be in the conversations today. We need to remember to continue to follow the federal food code. And we'll get into more of that a little bit, but we need to be very, very careful of reaching out for some of these new things that kind of come out of the woodwork, if you will. And we're talking about atomizers and, and, and foggers and misters and all kinds of different things. We'll get into it in a little bit, but we need to be very, very careful that one thing throughout all of this has not changed and it will not change, and that is the federal food code. So we need to be very, very careful. Hey, Eric, Tammy yes. here. Um, can I can I jump in with a couple of questions? Sure. Um, so you talked about you know products uh, that are becoming popular through this crisis. I'm wondering if you could um, give us a little bit more information about the application of bleach water. Ooh, yeah. Um, it's okay. There are some cases where um, chlorine bleach is or, or can be a registered sanitizer or disinfectant. Okay, uh, not all of them are, and you have to be very, very careful. So let's just say you are right now a, a big fan of bleach, which just heads up, I am not. Um, 
However, it is, it tends to be somewhat popular. The problem with chlorine, not only does it not have that bacterial static effect, so when we sanitize at 99.9%, .9 and when we disinfect at 99.999%, it's not 100%. That would be with sterilization. That would be in, a, in an operating room. So we still have bacteria. We still have microorganisms on that surface. Chlorine won't have that bacterial static effect. So it will continue to reproduce at a pretty rapid rate. On top of the fact that chlorine is incredibly corrosive, and though for some reason it's American habit to kind of smell bleach and think clean, actually really what's happening is, is what you're smelling is the oxidation of the surfaces that you put that bleach on. It's slowly breaking things down. So over a matter of months and years, you will see um, the cause and effect uh, of using a chlorine. Now, I get it. In some cases in our industry, we do use chlorine. For example, we use chlorine in low temp dish machines to sanitize um, only because it, quaternary ammoniums would foam up in a dish machine with so much turbulence. We also use chlorine um, to help oxidize or whiten white um, linen in a laundry uh, facility. Uh, but as far as cleaning and disinfecting, it is not the most appropriate. And I, I will caution this, uh, be very, very careful atomizing or misting uh, any type of chlorine. Um, if it gets in your lungs, it can cause a real problem. And I think a lot of the uh, new products that we've seen pop up recently, um, if you pay very close attention at not just the level of PPE, but also uh, who can be in the area while you're actually using um, these devices. I mean, you not we're not just talking about uh, a normal PPE. We're talking about using a respirator um, and not having anybody in the room. Now, following best practices per CDC is incredibly effective, cost effective, and quick. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. What was in existence before is what we need to be using in the future and be very, very careful of some of these products that are kind of coming out of nowhere. Does that help answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's go back into the kitchen where we're going to talk about uh, more sanitizing process and procedures because it really doesn't matter if you're talking about a dish machine, a three compartment sink, surface sanitizing in the kitchen or in front of the house in, in, in the dining room. It is still the same five steps. Pre-scrap, wash, rinse, sanitize for one to two minutes. I believe Wisconsin is two minutes. And then finally, air dry, no towel drying. Whether it was pre-COVID-19, current today, or post-COVID-19, these five same steps will not change moving forward. And it doesn't matter who you're doing business with. If it's this distributor or that manufacturer, this is the food code. So there is no magic button here. We need to be very careful. We need to continue following the food code. We pre-scrap to get rid of the gross soils, wash that surface with a light duty cleaner, degreaser, or even a pot and pan detergent. Rinse that off, sanitize for one to two minutes, and leave it to air dry. No sanitizers or disinfectants are manufactured to be meant to dried back up or wiped back up. They're all just simply meant to be misted on the surface and allowed to air dry. And we'll get more detailed into the air drying topic here in a little bit, but it's still the same five steps. Let's talk about the dish machine. And I want to make sure that we stress that we're going to try and talk about some of the things that we see changing and then not changing post-COVID-19. So let's talk about low and high temp dish machines. There has been a big push recently that I have noticed with a lot of end users, a lot of operators like yourself, wanting to have their low temp dish machine temperatures and concentrations changed to ensure proper sanitizing and make sure they're just killing as much stuff as possible. And I'm here to stress, we cannot do this. We have to continue following the food code and we haven't been given any new direction from the CDC or anyone on our best practices or any changes to our best practices for COVID-19. So we're still looking at a minimum water temperature of 120 degrees for low temp dish machines. We're still looking at a sanitizer concentration between 50 and 100 parts per million. 
cross chemical cross contamination is a very real threat and it can make someone very very sick so if we are under 50 parts per million for the concentration of the sanitizer for a low temp dish machine we are not killing enough bacteria if we go over 100 parts per million we have the potential to make someone very very sick okay another point on both high and low temp dish machines is it may have been somewhat elective or instructed by health inspectors but not demanded uh, that we use log charts and the NRC with Gordon Food Service has always done a great job uh, Amy and her team of creating these log charts whether it be for a high or low temp dish machine or even a three compartment sink and now it's coming in the future a log chart for proper disinfecting concentrations as well it's important we believe very strongly in the future uh, on our side of the industry that this is going to become uh, pretty mandatory to use uh, everything um, as it is and then start using the log charts. So the high temp dish machine is going to be a little bit different. Um, so instead of low temp, now with high temp we're actually sanitizing not with chlorine but hot water. We're still looking at a minimum rinse temperature of 180 degrees, which when, again, all of us here, I believe we've stood next to a health inspector right next to the dish machine and discussed that high temp rinse. And actually, the, the rinse temperature itself does not matter. And it's very frustrating. When you have a health inspector in front of you and they're looking at the gauge on the machine, and clearly it's getting over 180 degrees, but they still don't care and you throw in your waterproof thermometer and you run it through the dish machine, you pull it out, and it shows them again that it's over. That's because it actually, with all due respect, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the wash temp is or the rinse temp. What matters is the plate surface temperature breaching 160 degrees for seven seconds. That's actually what the food code entails. So whether you need 185, 186, 188 degree rinse temperature, that's what matters is the actual plate surface temperature. Personally, I'm a big fan of the thermal labels. You affix them right onto the thickest plate you have and you run them through the machine. If the square turns black, you've reached 160 degrees for seven seconds. I know a lot of people like to use the T-sticks. That's fine. You wedge them between a fork. But honestly, the only thing that really does is, again, verify the temperature of the water, which, per the food code, doesn't really matter. It's the plate surface temperature. And again, uh, the only thing that we really see changing in the future is a mandate on using these high and low temp log charts. Okay, let's talk about three compartment sinks for a second. Three compartment sinks, just like with a dish machine, have the same five steps. Pre-scrap, wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry. And it's not because you're doing, again, business with this distributor or that manufacturer. This is a federal food code. And I'll remind you that we need to continue using the QT40 test strips to test sanitizers and reserve those QT1000s for testing your disinfecting concentrations in environmental service or even in your dietary restrooms. Okay, what we do see changing moving forward with no exceptions is it will have to be an EPA registered sanitizer and at label dilution. I think lovingly long gone are the days where we can just maybe throw a jug of bleach under the counter and kind of call it good. It's going to have to be a registered EPA sanitizer uh, at label dilution and everything is going to have to check out. So that's one of the things that we do kind of see in uh, going away after a while here and of course using that three tank sink log chart from the NRC at Gordon Food Service Nutritional Resource Center um, is going to be uh, mandatory. All right. Hey, Eric, one more question in this uh, before you move on to the next section. Um, how often do you recommend using thermal labels? The thermal labels, I would actually use those uh, at the beginning of every shift um, to ensure that every dish that that operator is responsible for is actually being sanitized. Um, we don't know what the future, no, no one here knows what exactly, um, you know, the future holds. But that's personally, if I was, uh, you know, running a facility, that's what I would be mandating. Um, and then every, at the start of every single shift, it's tested. Thank you. 
Okay, so we'll talk about kitchen surface sanitizing, the processes and procedures, and you're kind of you're kind of seeing me repeat myself deliberately, but I'm starting to sound like a broken record. It is still, whether again it's a dish machine, three compartment sink, or any type of surface sanitizing, it's still the same five steps. Pre-scrap, wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry. Um, based on the individual states, it may be a one minute contact time for the sanitizer, it might be a two minute contact time. So again, the federal food code is addressed every couple of years, and then that is disseminated down to the individual states. Individual states can then take that food code and they can either choose to adopt them, or they can choose to make them stronger. So the example is here in the state of Michigan, we took the federal food code, the one minute contact time for sanitizers, and we left it. Many years ago, the state of Wisconsin said, okay, we hear you federal, but we're actually going to change that from one minute. We're now going to make it two minutes. So that is the code in Wisconsin. But what Wisconsin could not do is change that to a 30 second or a 45 second. So they can't weaken that food code. They can only strengthen it. So and then furthermore, the states disseminate down to the individual or local municipalities that can either change um, or make them stronger or keep them the same as well. So it's always good to uh, keep abreast of your local health codes. We do see, again, with no exceptions, moving forward using an EPA-registered sanitizer, and it must be at label dilution. Front of the house and the dining rooms, sanitizing processes and procedures, again, we don't see anything changing. The EPA is already defined and has for many years the definition of what is a food contact surface in the kitchen and what is a food contact surface in the dining room. And Again, I can't stress this enough. I know I've said it a couple times during this presentation, but it doesn't matter who you're doing business with. It could be the, the largest distributor or manufacturer or the smallest. We still have to use the same five-step process, a pre-scrap, wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry, regardless of the product. And it has to be a registered sanitizer at label dilution. I know everyone is looking to turn a table. It's important, but please understand, that we have to continue following the food code. I know everyone is nervous. I know everyone's scared. It's our first global pandemic, but we still need to continue following this food code. Okay, there's going to be a time, each one of you here, you've probably already thought it yourself. Back at the beginning of this presentation when I said that sanitizers alone will not kill COVID-19. And you're going to want to attempt or at least think about trying to use a disinfectant on a food contact surface, and I'm here to tell you this is not a good idea. This does not. This is not allowed in the federal food code or any state food code. Chemical cross-contamination is a very real threat. It's a big concern, and it is a potential lawsuit. We haven't been given any different direction for killing COVID-19 on a food contact surface, so we must continue to follow current best practices, and that is to follow the food code. Now, I would ask you to push back on any thoughts and any theories on disinfecting a food contact surface. However, with the people above you or whomever you are talking with, if all of those conversations are exhausted, I will tell you that yes, you can. You can disinfect a food contact surface. It goes against the food code, but theoretically you can. And as a matter of fact, on the EPA efficacy report, and on the text sheets and on the label, it gives instructions on how to disinfect a food contact surface, but I will advise against this. Number one, if you do not rinse that surface thoroughly after 10 minutes of wet contact time, again, the, the, the potential of chemical cross-contamination and making someone very sick is real, and it is very easily done, and it happens all the time. So following the procedures that is already in the food code of pre-scrap, wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry is going to take you roughly three to five minutes to perform. I will remind you that this is a virus that's pretty easily killed. 20 seconds of hand washing will kill this virus. If you pre-scrap, wash, rinse, and sanitize that surface with a registered EPA sanitizer, we have gone a long way in eradicating that virus on that surface as well. However, I understand the fear is real. The need is real to reassure not only yourself, your employees, but also your residents or your guests that you're doing all you can to kill COVID-19, and I get it. But you then must wash that surface, apply that disinfectant, let it sit the entire 
10 minute wet contact time. Then completely and thoroughly rinse that surface afterwards, getting all that surface out. A, a process that takes between 14 and 15 minutes, maybe 13 minutes. So it is not the most practical way. It goes against the food code. However, it is possible. In theory, you can do it. Now, I understand that a lot of people, and this is mostly for restaurants, they're receiving a lot of uh, reopen orders. And I, I understand that a lot of healthcare facilities, you guys didn't close down, right? But a lot of people are gotten a lot of information being thrown at them all at once. Everybody's nervous. Everybody's scared. They're scared of the virus. They're scared of getting sued. And even that, the actual laws or rules that are being written are very confusing because the people who are writing them don't always understand the definition between sanitizing and disinfecting, and it's confusing the industry just a little bit. But know this, we must follow the food code yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So hopefully I didn't get too long-winded on that part. So again, I realize a lot of you, most of you, um, are all dietary, but it is important to talk about environmental service disinfecting because you will be responsible for this moving forward in your dietary restrooms and also in your lobby areas. It will be separate from disinfecting. So unlike with sanitizing where we have a contact time of one minute, what we do with disinfecting is simply apply that registered disinfectant to a clean cloth and we clean the surface and we allow it to dry, air dry, for 10 minutes. That's really all we have to do. So 10 minutes of air drying and no towel drying is needed. We talk about the bathroom surfaces. This happens to be maybe a little pictogram of a hotel room uh, where all they do is, again, apply that disinfectant to a clean cloth, wipe that surface down, and as the code says, be left unmolested, which means not touched, for 10 minutes. That's all that has to happen. And I think a lot of people get a little confused when they think about, oh, it has to have a either a one or a two minute contact time for sanitizers or, or, or even a 10 minute contact time for disinfectants. People get in their minds this image of pools and puddles of disinfectant dripping off of things. No, 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 no. It just has to be applied and left to air dry. Even though something doesn't look wet or moist, it is still damp and it just simply needs to be left to air dry, and that's all. We don't have to get the stopwatch out. We don't have to go on break for 10 minutes every time we disinfect something just so we can come back and wipe it up. It's There's no towel drying needed or necessary. Okay, something that is becoming very, very prevalent, um, and that is the processes in the laundry room. One of the things that I find interesting is, um, you know, I kind of call myself a professional germaphobe. Um, it's my job to kind of track cross-contamination and, and things of this nature. If you really think about, uh, you know, 23 years I've been doing this, um, and one of my first days I walked into a dish room and I kind of thought to myself, this is interesting because this is a room, albeit professional, think of a nursing home, think of a hospital, where all things perfectly disgusting, nasty, bacteria-ridden dishes, plates, there's salmonella, there's, there's all kinds of stuff, theoretically, on these plates. And they're all coming into the dish room. And let's just take a, a high temp conveyor machine, for example. The individual dish operator is, is loading the plates up in that dish rack and he's spraying it off and he's got this, 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 the food soils on his hands, this microorganisms. And he's pushing them in or they're pushing it in one side of the machine. And a few seconds later, perfect, clean, pristine, and sanitary dishes come back out the other side. It's perfect. I mean, dish machines are really very expensive sanitizing machines. That's really what they are. With the dishwasher, that's us. That's the people washing or operating the machine. This is just simply, uh, you know, a very, very expensive sanitizer. So he pulls that plate or that rack out, and without even so much as washing their hands, he starts unloading those racks, that perfectly clean, pristine, sanitary dishes and we start handing that out. That is that is classic cross-contamination. So we feel very strongly that uh, one thing that's going to be mandated is they're going to start looking at what we do as an employee in between dirty racks and clean racks and what that individual operator does. Well, the same can be true in a laundry machine. It doesn't matter if this is at home or if this is in a commercial um, or as they say, an OPL, on-promise laundry, uh, in, a, in a nursing home or even a hospital. 
you think about all of the carts of soiled linen that are coming down the hallway and they're heading towards the laundry room. Now, hopefully all the employees are using the proper PPEs in which I'll remind you, the personal protective equipment list, the recommendation is written in both English and in Spanish on the product label itself, as well as the product text sheet and the SDS document. So we'll get into that here in a, in a little bit, but think of, think of this laundry cart filled with contaminated linen coming in either from a hotel, a nursing home, or a hospital. And the operator comes in wearing proper PPE and they put all that soil linen into that washer and they, they even use the proper load of contaminated linens. And then that poor wash, or uh, excuse me, the, the same laundry cart sits there in front of that laundry machine and waits until 25, 35, 45 minutes later, that load is done, and then they offload all that perfect, pristine laundry back down into that dirty cart. So we feel very strongly as an industry that that is going to change as well. And then we're not talking about uh, you know scrubbing or scouring these um, these carts every between every wash. Just simple application of an EPA registered disinfectant and allowed to air dry while that load is being run. That's really what we're looking at. So if you think about not only the laundry cart, but really all of the time that we spend in the laundry room, do we really actually take the time to disinfect that room? Do we take the time to sanitize inside of a dish room? Again, this is where all things perfectly clean and pristine and sanitary or disinfected come into contact with all things that are not. So all of these things post COVID-19 we strongly believe in our industry are going to change and change quickly. So we're now looking at um, disinfecting all uh, commonly touched surfaces inside of a laundry room, disinfecting those laundry carts in between every load, and then always using the suggested PPE or personal protective equipment. It is again important to understand that we as an industry, we can't force you to use the proper PPEs, we can only suggest, and we've done that by putting it again on the label in English and in Spanish, the text sheet and the SDS document. If you if you can't find the list of recommended PPEs, uh, give Gordon Food Service a call. We can, or, or even U.S. Chemical, we can give you that list, no problem, but please encourage your individual employees to use that. Okay. Hey, Eric, can I, yes. can I ask um, a laundry-related procedure question? Um, yes. Should dish towels be washed separate from everything else? They they really should because typically we're looking at a different type of soil. So one of the things that we do in a laundry cycle is we always want to separate not only, you know, obviously uh, towels from bedspreads or sheets um, based on the fabric type because we have synthetics versus cottons but we also have two different types of soils. We have the inert soils like dirt, um, things of that nature, grass. Then we also have the synthetic soils, which is a lot of the greases and soils. So you think about anything from uh, makeup stains in a hotel room to some of the heavier greases and soils and burnt carbon, carbonized food uh, inside of a kitchen. We really wanna separate that. So a couple of reasons. Number one, we know how to appropriately dose that laundry wheel with the appropriate amount of products to get that clean without actually hampering and, and sending some of those soils, the greases and the carbonized food soils onto other linen that then we have to treat differently. So we really wanna separate that. And I will say that in some cases, um, I've even uh, requested uh, that someone have a separate home style laundry machine in, for example, a hospital or nursing home specifically for kitchen wear, because sometimes we need heavier um, butyl-based cleaners, really aggressive cleaners to really break those soils down, because if we don't, and then they go through the laundering cycle in the dryer, they can actually start a dryer fire if too many of those um, soils and greases kind of build up, so it's very, very dangerous, and, and we don't want to do that to a normal, for example, pillowcase or, or uh, personal wear inside of a nursing home cycle, uh, anything like that. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, one more quick question in this space. Um, do you have recommendations on how you can disinfect, uh, disinfect a fabric linen cart? Oh, yeah. I mean, any, any disinfectant registered with the EPA um, is going to be a, a value option. So we listed out the nine different products 
in uh, in the array line that are registered through the EPA to kill the human coronavirus or COVID-19, any of those products um, are, are recommendable. Um, there are disinfectants of all different kinds of colors, dilution ratios, and scents. Really take a look at the EPA efficacy report. Make sure that you've got good cleanability and choose that product. Of course, there's a thousand different pack size options and, and scents and aromas and, and colors and things like that. But any registered disinfectant can be used to disinfect a laundry cart or even a laundry room itself. Great. This, I'm glad we're touching on this topic because there's some good questions coming in on it. Um, can, I, can I ask a couple more? Sure. Um, so how about for those folks who um, do resident laundry? What type of separating should be done on those uh, materials before laundering them? Mm, yeah, that, that's actually a great point. And when we get to that in here in about 30 seconds, we'll be able to identify not only what we can do for infectious linen or, uh, you know, protocols for uh, microorganisms and laundry for colors, but also for white linens as well. So we really kind of break that out. Um, so we'll be coming on that very, very shortly. Um, Great. I want to jump in. <laughs> do, you, do you have any other questions? I can... Uh, there are a few more, but, you know, I'll pause and see if your next section covers them. Okay, very good. Um, I want just for everyone, I know it seems a little silly, but I want for everyone to just kind of play this out with me um, and pretend you yourselves are actually the COVID-19 virus. I know it seems a little silly, but this is very, very important. Um, now, remember, washing your hands for 20 seconds will kill this, this microorganism, this virus. It's pretty easily killed. 20 seconds of hand washing. If you think about what you would go through if you were in the laundering process, if you yourself were COVID-19 on the linen, through the laundry process, we're looking at both the high and low alkalinities, the pH swings from the different detergents and acids that we actually add to this wash wheel. On top of the mechanical action inside that wash wheel, the temperatures of the water, not to mention the temperatures of the dryer, which can exceed 180 to 200 degrees for 25, 30 minutes. There is no way that any product or manufacturer or even process will be guaranteed to kill bacteria. EPA will not allow it. But we know that going through all of that, we've gone a good long way into killing that bacteria. But this is very, very important to understand that if anybody comes to you saying, I've got this, I've got this one thing, whether it's a product, a process, a procedure, it doesn't matter, and it is 100% sound, the EPA says, nope, it kills everything. It is not true. The EPA will not okay any process, any product, any procedure that claims to kill 100% bacteria or any virus on a fabric. It's impossible. There's too many places for these little microorganisms to hide in order to actually definitively know. So we only can follow best practices, followed by the CDC, but it's best practices. So it's not like our sanitizing at 99.9% .9 or disinfecting at our 99.999%. The only thing we can do is follow best practices and protocols set out by the CDC. So here's the processes, Tammy, that you were talking about. So there's the chlorine process of killing bacteria. And 98% of all laundry loads already accomplish this, but it's only for whites. So white towels, white sheets, a white cloth, um, the chlorine process. And that is achieving 125 parts per million for five minutes. I'm here to tell you all the hundreds of hours that I've spent inside of a commercial laundry room, 98% of all the linens that, that set up for white loads, they're already accomplishing this. So this entire time, for years and decades, a normal white load for whites has already been killing bacteria. Okay, but unfortunately, that's not always the case, specifically in nursing homes, where we do have, to your question, Tammy, uh, a lot of personal loads. So there are two non-chlorine processes that we can take a look at. Now, the first one's pretty rare. It's pretty hard to accomplish. Now, what we will need for this non-chlorine process is 160 degree water for 25 minutes. I'm here to tell you that's it's pretty rare. I can think of about a handful of customers in my tenure that could actually accomplish this because you'll need steam heat. Now, 
you won't just need 160 degree water. You'll need more like 180 to 185 to sustain you throughout that 25 minutes. So it's pretty rare. Thankfully, we have the quaternary ammonium process, specifically with a product called Ultimate Sanitizer. Now, the instructions are actually on the label, extended label, also on the EPA efficacy report and the text sheet. But what this requires, I'm not always a huge fan of this because it takes so much product to do, but it is a valuable option of adding 1.33 ounces of this product per gallon of water, not per pound of linen, the way we're normally used to speaking in a laundry room. It's per gallon of water in the wash wheel at 95 degrees for five minutes will kill microorganisms. We have EPA um, documentation that says it is one of the best practices. Again, no one, it doesn't matter who you're working with, can prove that this is the way to do it, regardless of how much it costs, what it's made out of, whether it's chlorine, whether it's whatever, no one can prove it. But the quaternary ammonium or the ultimate sanitizer option is one way that we can sanitize personal clothing without using chlorine. Now, it's not gonna be easy to do, it's not gonna, it takes quite a bit of product, because if you think about, you either have a 35 pound machine, 55 pound machine, upwards of 100 to 150 pound washers, that's a lot of product. However, we can show that we have sanitized that linen through the CDC protocol. So hopefully that kind of helps a little bit. In the home stretch here, I just wanted to remind everybody, and I certainly, and I know Amy and Tammy, you guys agree with me, everyone here on the call, uh, everyone listening in, you guys are the ones on the front line um, every day working through this, uh, making, making sure people get fed. Um, you're working with uh, some of the folks with the most weakened immune systems. And of course, that's who it's going to attack first, that's COVID-19. So of course, if you're not feeling well, stay home. I cannot stress enough, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and wash your hands again. 20 seconds of hand washing will eradicate COVID-19. We need to do it as often as possible. Using the proper personal protective equipment and following product label recommendations and instructions is essential. We must continue to do it. Now, the recommended PPEs are on every single label, the text sheets, the SDS documents, even the EPA reference sheet. Look them up, they're right there. Finally, we need to follow the food code. Use proper cleaning and sanitizing on food contact surfaces. Proper disinfecting on non-food contact surfaces. We cannot start using other processes and other procedures because of COVID-19. We cannot start disobeying a federal, state, or local food code without further direction or instructions from them. It is a legal liability, so we have to be very, very careful. Now, I understand that is of little, little reassurance, it's little consequence, I understand that, but we have to be very, very careful in following the procedures that we should have been doing or will be doing or have been doing in the past and now will be doing in the future are going a long way in eradicating this microorganism, COVID-19, or the human coronavirus. So uh, that being said, uh, I wanted to remind everyone um, that we do have a website out there that is dedicated to the Array product line. It's called the Array Chemical Support Guide. Um, there is the URL, though. I know it's a little long, but there is a URL. You can also click on that. Um, and there's just a ton of information, not only on other products, but specifically to products that kill COVID-19. Um, Gordon Food Service and Tammy, they've done a great job of developing a lot of brochures for infection prevention, safe cleaning practices and programs post-COVID-19 for kitchens, stores, schools, hotels, um, things of that nature. So I welcome you to that site. It is a very valuable resource tech sheets, SDS documents, EPA reference, even training videos to help uh, help with your staff trainings. So that being said, uh, Tammy, I wanted to kind of kick it back over to you if we had any questions, comments. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, thanks for the thorough presentation and, and walking through all those different pieces. 
we did have a couple of questions um, that came in that uh, I don't think were answered uh, through that content. Um, the first one I'm actually going to answer, um, give you a chance to catch your breath. Um, but one question that came in is, if it was okay to wear a medical mask instead of an N95 mask in the back of the house or in the kitchen, um, what I would say is that through Gordon Food Service, um, you know, there are many different levels of masks available within the industry, and N95 is certainly one of them. Um, many of them are going to the healthcare market. Um, so what we are selling is the ASTM level one mask or level two mask, um, and, and those can be worn uh, in the kitchen to help with some of those uh, PPE needs. Um, a couple of other things that came in, Eric, and I'm going to defer these back to you. Um, is, are delivery carts considered to be a food contact surface? Um, delivery carts, we will say that typically they are considered a food contact surface. Even though one could argue that they're not, their food is not actually come in contact. But remember, if a table, if a chair, if a high chair for the kiddos are considered a food contact surface, then so must the delivery cart. And yes, needs to be cleaned and sanitized. Uh, after every use, or as they say, every round. Um, that is very common to clean and sanitize uh, those surfaces. That is correct, yes. Thank you. Um, and what about, you know, is disinfecting at the end of each shift considered enough, or should should we be doing that more towards the two to four hour range that, that was stated earlier? Yeah, and as of right now, a lot of people simply disinfect either once a day or after every shift. Um, as, as we said in the beginning, we, we just know, know uh, you know, things are going to continue to change uh, post-COVID-19. We really do feel that it's going to be almost a continuous process of disinfecting every two to four hours. Um, as of right now, folks are either doing it once a day or once a shift, but definitely in between, in between a residence. So as one's moving in or out of a uh, particular room for an extended period of time. But this has been widely unregulated for decades. Uh, being the disinfecting, not like sanitizing. That's been regulated pretty heavily for a long time now uh, with three compartment sinks and then surface sanitizing. I think this global pandemic, um, if anything comes of this that's any good, I think it's going to be an eye-opener of, of really what are we doing down the hallway uh, from the kitchen and getting into environmental service and how are we um, killing these microorganisms. So, yeah, we're looking at every two to four hours. Um, but again, we'll wait to see what's uh, what's being discussed. And of course, we'll all be made very aware and uh, provide more trainings at the time. I have a couple questions in the laundry space um, that I'll try to get to quickly here. Um, what are the recommendations that you have for a facility where patients uh, wash their own laundry? Is there a process that you recommend for disinfecting between each of the patient's load, if there is any? Well, that's very tough and a very common question. Um, there is no specific procedure as I listed out the chlorine process or a quaternary ammonium-based process per se. Um, so we really must rely on that scenario where I kind of asked everyone, might have been a little silly at the time, but, but now it's, it, it, it's kind of helping, is that pretend you yourself are COVID-19. Are you going to survive? When 20 seconds of hand washing is eradicated tw uh, COVID-19, um, washing those linens, even in a home style, for personals with all the detergent, the hot water in that machine, um, the extended pH, including the dryer temperatures, which can exceed 180 to 200 degrees for 35 minutes, we've gone a very long way. We cannot, as I said before, prove that we have killed anything in any laundry. No one can. The CDC won't allow it. So that is our best practice as of today, is just simply using adequate detergent and drawing, drying those fabrics thoroughly. Thank you. And, and last question, um, just due to time here, um, that's kind of along the same lines. I saw many come in kind of along the same, same line about, um, you know, care of the washer drum itself um, and making sure that it that it's um, you know ready to go for the next load but I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of along the same lines of the process you just outlined 
Yes, it is. Now, there are some opportunities there, maybe about, starting about a decade ago, when front-loading home-style washers became very prevalent, very popular. I know I went out and I bought myself one. Um, and then we quickly learned that because of the angle of the drum, it actually would hold on to about 32 ounces of water-ish, about 22 to 32 ounces of water in the bottom of that drum. And if it sat in there too long, it would become stagnant. Um, and a lot of people would find almost like this little rancid odor, and we kind of thought, oh boy, there's cross-contamination. Well, what actually was is just remnant or leftover water from the previous cycle. So they've a lot of manufacturers, and I won't call them out specifically, but a lot of manufacturers have fixed that or remedied that with some of their new styles. We don't see that much anymore. So cross-contamination from one load to another, we're really not concerned about too much anymore because we are um, killing a lot of that bacteria during during the wash cycle and not as much as that water is still being left over in that wash cylinder, if you will. Hopefully that made sense. Yes, it did. Um, and again, I just want to thank you. I know we had a few other questions in there, um, but due to time, um, I'm going to uh, pass this back over to Amy for any closing remarks or thoughts. And again, Eric, thank you for your time today and helping share your, your best um, experience and knowledge in this area. No problem. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Again, yeah, I echo what Tammy said. And also, Tammy, to you, I can't thank you and Eric enough for taking time out of what I know is an incredibly hectic world that you both are living in right now to share your expertise. And also, what I think everyone can take away from this presentation is the passion that you bring um, to this topic as well. So it was really informative. I thought you did a great job, Eric, of really highlighting what has and, you know, hasn't changed with COVID-19, pointing back to the food code in many examples. I thought that was a great thing to reinforce with our customers today. A couple questions that came through that I know we sent some individual answers to that I wanted to follow up on. Um, this presentation it is being recorded, and we are going to post a recording of this presentation on Gordon Experience. Um, under the resources page, we have a coronavirus action page. So we will be posting it on that coronavirus action page, and we hope to have the recording out there in just a couple days. A couple of questions came through regarding some of the um, log charts that Eric referenced as well. Those are also available on Gordon Experience. Those are on our food safety awareness page under the forms and resources. So those are available for you as well. Um, as I mentioned, the continuing education certificates will be emailed out to all participants tomorrow morning. Uh, we also received some questions about sharing the slides, so I will just connect with Eric and Tammy offline about that. And if that's a possibility, we'll make sure you get those. If not, do keep in mind we have the recording available. Again, thank you. I know um, you guys taking time out of your day to attend. I know that's a big time commitment and I uh, really hope this presentation was very worthwhile. So we appreciate your time as well. And with that, we'll wrap things up. And thank you guys. Everyone have a great afternoon.